Hey, I'm Justin from Alcatree, and in this video, I'm going to teach you the basics of digital electronics and FPGAs. Before we get anything too serious, we need to first go over what it means for something to be digital. In the context of electronics, digital refers to a circuit that deals with discrete states instead of a fully continuous set of values used in an analog system. It's important to understand that digital things are really just a way to abstract away the messiness of real life. Digital circuits are actually just analog circuits that we expect to behave a certain way. So what is this abstraction? You guessed it, zeros and ones. All right, but what does this mean? I mean, most people know that computers use zeros and ones, but what are they actually? In the physical world, these two values are represented by a range of voltages. The actual ranges that define each one depend on the particular circuit and the technology used. For a circuit running off of 3.3 volts, a zero is often represented from anything from zero to 0 0.8 volts, while a one is anything from two to 3.3 volts. The values between these two ranges are often referred to as no man's land, and the circuits are designed to avoid this region. So to reiterate, for a circuit running off of 3.3 volts, a digital circuit is one that attempts to stick to these two extremes of zero volts and 3.3 volts, instead of using the full spectrum of voltages in between. But why do we do this? Isn't that kind of wasteful? We have all these voltages that we could use to represent data. The biggest reason that digital circuits are so widely used is because they are very robust. The real world isn't perfect, and circuits need to deal with all kinds of interference. This means that signals in a circuit will often see small voltages added or subtracted to them at random. This is known as noise. If the exact voltage in a circuit was really important, this noise could be devastating on the circuit's behavior. Instead, digital circuits are designed to remove noise. For example, in our 3.3 volt example from before, a circuit may be designed to accept anything from 0 to 0 0.8 volts as a 0, but may output something between 0 and 0 0.5 volts for a 0. For ones, it may accept something between 2 and 3.3 volts, and output between 2.4 and 3.3 volts. This means that each stage is trying to actively maintain the extremes of 0 and 3.3 volts. If you connected a bunch of these stages together and injected up to plus or minus 0 0.3 volts between each stage, it would still operate exactly the same as if it was in a sterile environment. All right, so now I've shown you how robust digital circuits are. Now let me show you what they can do. We'll start with the basic building blocks of everything. Logic gates. This is an AND gate. The standard version has two inputs and one output. Each one of these is a single bit, in other words, a zero or a one. The output of an AND gate will only be one when both inputs are one. If either of them is zero, then the output is zero. In other words, when the first input and the second input are one, then the output will be one. We can show this in what is known as a truth table. On the top and side of the table, we can list the possible inputs. On the inside of the table, we can list the values that correspond to those inputs. So here we can see that the output is only one when the first input and the second input are one. Note that we're already abstracting away how the circuit's implemented. In practice, an AND gate could be implemented with a handful of transistors, but this really isn't important to us now. We get to forget about all the messy real world issues and live in the perfect world of zeros and ones. There are a couple more logic gates to cover. The next one is the OR gate. And like the AND gate, it has two inputs and one output. However, its output is one when the first input is one or the second input is one. A variation of this is the exclusive OR, written as XOR. This gate only outputs one when either the first input is one or the second input is one, but not when both are one. Another way to think about this gate is that it will only output one when the inputs are different. Finally, the last gate is the simple NOT gate. This gate is unique in that it only has one input and one output. It simply outputs the opposite of what the input is. So if you give it a one, you get a zero. If you give it a zero, you get a one. There are variations of these three basic gates that are just combinations with them with a NOT gate at the output. These are called NAND, NOR, and XNOR. These gates have the same symbol as their standard versions, but a circle is drawn in the output to show it's inverted. These circles can also be used on inputs as a way to keep circuit diagrams cleaner. They're really just a way of showing that there's a NOT gate in the circuit without having to draw the full gate. All right, now we have a way to manipulate zeros and ones, but what use is that? Zeros and ones themselves don't mean anything. Instead, we can assign them whatever meaning we want as long as we're consistent in our design. The most obvious meaning to give them is true and false. One is typically true and zero is typically false. Using this scheme, we can design circuits to perform a set of logical operations. For example, we can make a circuit that will tell us to turn the lights on if we are home and it is dark. This is great, but having only two states is really limiting. Instead, it would be great if we could combine bits to allow us to represent more things. In practice, we can use any combination of bits to mean anything we want. They're really just arbitrary values after all. However, if we want to represent numbers, the standard binary representation is by far the simplest way. 
The binary number system is essentially the same as a decimal number system that you're used to, except that each digit can only be 0 or 1 instead of 0 through 9. In a decimal number system, the value of each digit is scaled by 10 to the power of its position. In binary, each value is scaled by 2 to the power of its position. For example, if we wanted to represent 12 in decimal, we would need 1 times 10 plus 2. In binary, we would need 1 times 8 plus 1 times 4. In other words, 12 and 1100. 0, 0. With this representation, we can start to do math. Let's run through an example of how we can add two numbers together. The procedure is actually the same exact thing as you would do for decimal numbers. To show this, let's add 8 and 11 together, aka 1000 0, 0, 0, and 1011. We can write this out just like we did in elementary school, with one number on top of the other. We will now go column by column, starting with the right side and moving to the left. In the first column, we have a 0 and a 1. 0 plus 1 is simply 1, so we can write that down as the answer. In the next column, we have exactly the same thing, so we also have a 1 as the answer. In the third column, we have two zeros, and 0 plus 0 is 0, so we can write down 0. The fourth column is a little bit more interesting, because 1 plus 1 is 2. But we can't write 2, so what do we do? Well, just like you would with decimal when two digits sum to more than 9, you carry the extra value over to the next column. In this final column, we end up with 1 plus 0 plus 0, which is simply 1, which makes our final answer 10011, or 19 which is great since we were adding 8 and 11. Doing all this by hand was pretty tedious, so let's make a circuit that can do it all for us. First, we can fill out a truth table to get an idea of what the circuit will need to do. Just like we did when we were adding by hand, we will look at each column at a time. So for the first column, we have two inputs, which are the two numbers, and we have one output, which is the result bit. Okay, looking at the truth table, it's obvious that this could be implemented with an exclusive OR gate, since the result bit is only one when the inputs are different. But we're not done yet. We also need a way to signal that this column has overflowed. Well, I mean, that's easy enough since it will only overflow when the first input and the second input are one, so we can simply use an AND gate. Putting these two gates together, we can make what is called a half adder. So why is it called half? That's because this circuit can't accept a previous column's overflow bit. We now need to modify this circuit a little bit so that it can have three inputs, one to include the carry. So when is the result bit one now? It's when the sum of the three bits is either one or three. In other words, when the value is odd. We can figure this out by looking at two bits at a time. We used an x over four to know when adding the inputs together would be odd. We can use another xor to know if adding another bit to this will keep it odd. This works because an odd number plus an odd number is even, and an even number plus an even number is even. Only when an odd number is added to an even number is the result odd. In other words, when the inputs are different, the result is odd. All right, now we have the result bit, but we need to update the carry bit. In other words, when will the value overflow? When any two bits are one. So if A and B are one, or A and the carry bit are one, or B and the carry bit are one. There we go, now we have a full adder. We can take this little block and copy and paste it a few times so that we can add multi-bit numbers together. Awesome, in just a couple minutes, we went from explaining what digital means all the way up to creating a circuit to add binary numbers together. But why stop here? Let's do something with our addition circuit. Let's make a counter. A counter is a circuit that just keeps adding one to a number. Simple enough, right? We can just take our addition circuit, hook one up to one of the inputs, and connect the output to the other input. But wait, what value would this even start at? When would it start counting? How fast would it count? Or even worse, since our adder computes one bit at a time, how does it know when the output is ready and the input can be read again. The short answer, this doesn't work. We need something that A has a sense of time and B can save the counter's value while the next value is being computed. This is where the flip-flop comes in, specifically the D-type flip-flop or DFF for short. The D in DFF stands for data. There are a couple other versions of flip-flops, but by far this is the most common one. In its most basic form, the DFF has two inputs and one output. One input is the clock input. Clocks are a special type of signal used by digital circuits to control the flow of information. A clock is simply a signal that toggles between zero and one with a set frequency. The frequency can be as slow as a few thousand times a second for a digital clock, or a few billion times a second for a computer. The other input on the DFF is called D, and the output is called Q. When the clock goes from zero to one, which is also known as a rising edge, 
the DFF saves the value of D and outputs it on Q. If D changes after the rising edge, it doesn't matter, and Q stays the same as the last value of D. That is, until the next rising edge of the clock, when it takes another snapshot. Since the DFF is saving the value of D, it's actually a single bit of memory. We can use the DFF to keep the counter under control. If we use the output of the adder as the input to the DFF, and the DFF's output as the input to the adder, we can increment the value in a predictable way. We can control how fast the counter will go by adjusting the frequency of the clock. A faster clock means a faster counter. However, there is a limit. In practice, our adder circuit will take some amount of time for the output to become valid after changing the input. If we sample the output before this time, we will be saving an invalid value into the DFF, which will feed back into the adder, making the whole thing fall apart. There is one thing we haven't covered. What is the initial value of the counter? Well, that's easy. It's whatever the initial value of the DFF is. But what value is that? Due to the nature of DFFs, when power is applied, they will randomly settle into a zero or one. This means our counter initial value is random, which isn't very useful. To fix this issue, DFFs have another input, reset. This input can be used to force it to a zero or a one. If it's used to force it to a one, this input is sometimes referred to as set instead of reset. After a circuit is powered on, it's typical to reset everything into a known state. All right, so now we've designed a working counter on paper that is, but let's actually build one. So now we have a couple of ways to do this. First, we could use discrete logic. You can buy chips that have a couple of logic gates or DFFs in them. We can get a truckload of these and build our circuit on a big breadboard. This way is very time consuming and error prone. Hooking up dozens or even hundreds of wires like this doesn't sound very fun to me. An alternative to this would be to get your circuit made on a silicon wafer. You could go and call up Intel or some other chip manufacturer and see how much money they'd want to build your circuit. But I'll save you some time and tell you that it's likely in the millions of dollars. So unless you're designing some crazy new complex chip or need thousands of these or millions of these made, it doesn't sound like a very good plan either. This is where FPGAs come in handy. FPGAs or field programmable gate arrays are a type of chip known as programmable hardware. They allow you to design a digital circuit and program them to become that circuit. They can be reprogrammed as many times as you want and are relatively inexpensive. Even the lower end FPGAs can fit reasonably complex circuits in them. For example, this board to the right of me has an FPGA in it that has a circuit that is reading values from a microphone, calculating the frequencies of the sound, and displaying them on a bunch of LEDs. You may be thinking to yourself, this seems like voodoo, and to some extent, you'd be right. These things are rather complex in the details, but at the simplest level, they're actually quite simple. To understand how an FPGA works, you need to know about one other common circuit component, the multiplexer. A multiplexer has a series of data inputs, a select input, and one output. Its job is to output the value of data that corresponds to the value of the select input. So if select is zero, then input zero is output. If select is three, then input three is output. And that's it. The multiplexer itself is made up of a bunch of logic gates, and we could run through the design of one, but that really isn't important for now. As you may have realized, digital circuit design is all about layers of abstraction. Once you can forget about the details underneath, you should. This allows you to focus on the bigger picture. Okay, so how is a multiplexer used in an FPGA? Well, we can use a multiplexer with a little bit of memory to become something called a lookup table or a LUT. This can then be used to implement arbitrary logic. For example, if we have a multiplexer with four data inputs, that means the select input needs to be two bits wide so we can have a value between zero and three. If we can program the data inputs to be whatever constants we want, we can make a circuit that takes two inputs and has an output where the relationship of these is programmable. For example, if we program the data inputs of the multiplexer to be 0, 0, 0, 1, then we just created an AND gate. If we program these instead to be 0, 1, 1, 0, we just made it into an XOR gate. The lookup tables in an FPGA are typically much bigger than just four bits, with the ones in the FPGA on the Alcatree AU having 64 data inputs and six select inputs. This means that each one can implement any circuit with six inputs and one output. All right, so that takes care of the logic side. There are also DFFs that connect to lookup tables outputs. In addition to these two critical aspects, there are numerous multiplexers that are used to route data where it needs to go. While the actual details of how all this works are much more complex, this is the gist of how an FPGA works. You have lookup tables that implement the logic, DFFs that control the flow, and tons of routing resources to connect everything up. Hopefully by now you realize how awesome FPGAs are. Before wrapping this video up, let me show you what it looks like to implement our counter on an FPGA. This isn't intended to be a how-to, but rather just an overview of what working with an FPGA is like. We will have much more in-depth tutorials to follow. 
When designing circuits for FPGAs, it's generally easiest to do so with what is known as a hardware description language, or HDL. With an HDL, you describe the behavior of the circuit you want, and the tools figure out how to implement it in hardware. At this level, you don't need to think about logic gates and all that. However, it's important to have an idea of how your circuit could be implemented, so that you know that it can still be efficiently done. In this example, I'm going to show you what it looks like to make a counter on this board, the Alcatree AU. This is Alcatree Labs, or IDE. The first step is to create a new project. We'll be working in Lucid, an easy to use hardware description language. Our project will be simple, with our counter all in the top level module. Modules are the building blocks for your design. They are kind of similar to functions when writing code in that you can reuse and nest them. Every module has a set of inputs and outputs. The inputs and outputs of the top level module are actual inputs and outputs on the chip. In our case, you can see we have an output that is 8 bits wide for the 8 LEDs on the board. We also have a clock input that connects to a 100 MHz oscillator, and there's another input that connects to the reset button on the board. We will use this to reset the counter to zero. Since the clock on the AU is quite fast, if we just used 8 bits for our counter, it would count way too fast to see. Instead, we can use a much larger 32-bit counter and just hook up the top 8 bits. This effectively divides the clock by 2 to the 24th, or roughly 16.8 million. This means the counter will increment approximately every sixth of a second. In Lucid, you simply declare a DFF type with a size for an array. We will make a DFF that is 32 bits wide, named CTR. By declaring it inside the clock and reset blocks, we hook up those signals to the DFF. We can connect the D input of the DFF to its Q output plus one. Conveniently, we don't have to describe the entire adder circuit, and we can just use the plus symbol. We then can connect the top eight bits of the DFF's Q output to the LEDs. We can then build the project. This takes a minute or two, so let's skip ahead. With the project built, we can load this onto the board and we can see the LEDs counting as expected. If we press the reset button, it will force the value of the DFF to zero. When we release it, it resumes counting. That about wraps things up for this introduction to digital electronics and FPGAs. Be sure to head over to our website, alcatree.com, for more information on the FPGA development board demoed here and our other boards. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe if you'd like to see more tutorials. When the next tutorial is available, you can click here to continue on to it. As always, thanks for watching.